had five number one albums with Silverchair, but this was your first number one album as a solo artist. So how did that feel? And uh, did it feel, you know, kind of different just knowing this was something you were doing all on your own? At risk of sounding materialistic, or it feels good when you're number one. It does, it just does. You'd be lying if you're lying. I always say I don't give a fuck, mm -hmm. and I don't, but then when it's number one, it feels, <laughs> it feels awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I, it felt incredible when I was, I, you know, it's, I do love when the music is strong enough, you know. Yeah. The, the music was strong enough to do it, but, you know, other than that, I don't, I don't know how how that would have happened. Great record company. How did it feel to know that your fans supported you so much during this time and that critics love this album? <clears throat> Amazing. It, um, yeah, I mean, the whole, the whole thing with Future Never was that I was going to make, um, I was going to make that record regardless of whether it was a success or not. I know a lot of really great albums that just, just because of the circumstances, just get overlooked, just get ignored. And I was, I was prepped for it. I was like, it's going to be one of those ones that I'm going to love and no one's going to believe me that it was good. <laughs> and especially, you know, we decided no singles, no video clips, no anything, let's just let the album do the talking. What was really refreshing for me working on this project was the completely different approach to making a record that I've been used to over the last, well, most of my career basically, which is being a pop songwriter producer, mainly working on singles and singing song by song and release by release and not having a very often having a big picture album of 12, 13 songs that, 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 that really tell a story. And, and, and that's, that was an, an incredibly refreshing um, experience on my behalf because, yeah, it was new for me to see Daniel focus on a record like this that didn't really have a single, that didn't really have a, it was really, it was really about the album, the album as a whole, not as all the individual parts. And that was really cool to see. and that really opened my eyes as well to looking at a different approach to making music and, um, and making a whole album as a piece of art. When Danny and I worked on When We Take Over, um, which I think is probably my favorite of the ones that we've worked on, um, when I heard it for the first time is when he just played it to me on the piano. Um, I thought it was such a magical piece of music. The piano part is just so really floaty and sweet and then, yeah, and then it just grows into this big climax and we also went pretty um, extreme on the string arrangements on that one towards the end with all the crazy runs. And both from a production perspective and from a string arrangement perspective, I think it's something that I'm immensely proud of um, on the way the whole thing comes together. Um, we recorded the piano in a really unique way at our friend Sean Carey's studio. That was that's why you get these really weird kind of overtones on the piano because it was the felt dampers and we did a really interesting um, technique on that. And I feel when I listen to that song from beginning to end, it delivers. It's short and punchy, but I don't feel like I miss out on anything. Yeah, I feel very, very, very positive about that song. Someone call an ambulance was um, an interesting story how that one came together because that really opened my eyes when we worked on that song on what a producer genius Daniel is. Like, you know, we're both producing on these songs together and then and the ideas he has and how he hears things in his head. Um, and then it's up to me as an engineer producer to help him make those ideas come to life. There's so many crazy production tricks in that song that um, all came out of his head and we had to find a way to make work because some of them are really complex ideas and, and he, in his head he goes to really um, out there places that you know, I would never think of. And that was a, yeah, I learned a lot from that at the time on how creative you can be with production.
on those Thieving Birds Part 3, um, that started off as just a piano vocal. It, just on its own already, it felt so powerful just to have the piano and the vocal, and, and that his vocal is ridiculous on it. The way he sings it, there's so much emotion in it. And um, I self, myself as a producer, I never really understood for myself where this thing could go. But um, to then hear where both Slumberjack and Lisa Gerard took the song with Daniel from where I'd left it, which was, I sent them the piano and the vocal, and then to hear it come back as it did in the end, yeah, I, I feel very satisfied about that as well. Like, that's the power of co collaboration, I guess, when other people get involved. My name's Bo Golden. I met Dan in 2015 when I was playing keys for the Opera House talk shows. We got a text from Dan. I was like, hey, you guys should come up to my place. Like, wouldn't it be fun? You should bring all your gear, like, bring everything. You know, I don't have a computer. Like, bring a computer as well. Um, we should just muck around and write some stuff if you're into it. And myself and Dave Jenkins and Jake Meadows, who are in the live band, we ended up writing uh, Where Do We Go on the record together and producing that. Bright lights on the buying Traffic can stop crying Breathe the world I'm singing instead He called me up and he's like, hey, I've got this other song. It's like, I'm really excited about it. Do you want to come to the studio? Um, it's called Emergency Calls Only and he sent me this little um, voice memo of it. And this one he's like, man, I've got guitars in it. I want you to play grand piano. I want you to play organ. I want you to play bass and blah, blah, blah. Got to the studio, spent three days on that. He was pumped. We were all pumped. Uh, it turned out um, very different to what we worked on, but we recorded so much stuff at the studio. The only reference for writing Dangerous Boy for us was we wanted to be like a super cool and weird because that was something we were working at the time. And Dan came in and he thought it was super cool and weird and he thought it was so funny and we had such a laugh and we were making it um, with like such a, like no inhibitions and also just the fact that it was like, it was like just, a, I think it's an odd piece of music. Like I think it's been digested a lot better than I thought it would be now that it's time. Totally, yeah, harmonically, like the chords are, are unfriendly, there's no doubt. You know? mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But yeah, I think those moments, especially that, that bridge section, and even like, you know, that, let's get ready for this guitar, baby. Like, yeah, that yeah. was just like, he thought that was so funny. And we're laughing yeah. and we're like, let's put it in the track. That's funny. And then he does like a two second guitar solo, which he also thinks funny. And yeah. he thinks it's funny. And then it's like, everything kind of just came together with a, a really good spirit around it. Yeah, that's true. I mean, that's like, obviously as great as it is to, to make music with, with Bo and Dan. It's like, the reason we went back and, like one of the big reasons we wanted to do mansions is because we just had heaps of fun. It didn't feel like, oh, let's, let's get to work. It was like, let's just like hang out and, and make something, you know? Mm. That just sits on that, yeah. Do you want to try it with, with this as well? Yeah, let's play it together. experimenting at the time with like little drum machines and weird little noises and we use this guy instead of pocket operator okay, cool. these kind of cool little drum machine toy things that they actually sound great you know um, and this is one of the things that Dan was like turn up 10, 10 dB it's funny like there's so many takes that Dan has ruined by just laughing in the middle of the take where he'll just bring up some kind of obscure joke from like three months ago or you know like we, we did the same but he's ruined hours of takes um so you know having to comp together that or it's unusable yeah. it's unusable stuff you know he'll think it's like hilarious he's as well. trying to have a laugh yeah yeah, sure, yeah yeah and again like when you're trying to comp that together like we're laughing kind of comping this thing together before we send it to him yeah yeah and trying to be serious you know you're getting it on film finally <laughs> It's almost like this album was a foreshadowing of events to come in a lot of ways. It's spooky. Yeah, it it's really, really is. Yeah, it, it, it fucks me up. <laughs> it really does. It's, it's weird. Um, I knew that that record was... I was saying something, but I, and I knew that, that it in some... I knew that it was poignant, and I knew that it meant something, but at the time, I was like, I don't really know what this is yet, but I know it's going to be important for me. 
Um, I had the exact same feeling when I wrote Diorama. I was like, I'm not exactly sure what this is, but I know it's, I know it's going to be important for some reason. I don't know. There's some things with art that are, they're just intangible. And another component that you're doing is a, a really massive art exhibition um, called Past, Present, Future, Never. Yeah. And uh, so how did you come up with this idea? And yeah, why did you kind of decide to go in that direction? When you're doing a project, you kind of throw 10 million ideas at the wall and see what sticks. And more often than not, one at best will stick and you'll get to do it. With this record, the good idea is stuck. And it's, uh, it's still unbelievable to me, given that all that happened around the record was going on. It's, um, it's a testament to my brother and the record company and everyone who's worked on the project. Like, they've really backed the vision. And I, I knew there was a way to be an artist in this world without having to be a rock star on stage playing the same songs, doing it and repeating it and touring. I knew there had to be a way and I was always told, nah, there's not. So I just made a movie in an art gallery. <laughs> you know, just... Whatever. <laughs> It's so, fucking easy. <laughs> it's, it's, it's incredible, you know. And from what I've heard about the art exhibition, and I am going to get to go to Melbourne to get a little sneak peek. Oh, awesome. which I'm super excited about. Yeah, I'm really excited to see it. Because I, I thought Future Never was quite possibly my last record ever. And when I listen to the lyrics and the songs, it feels like I'm saying goodbye. And I don't want that to be taken the wrong way, but it feels like I've, I'm, this is it. This is my statement. If I'm talking about I'm going to back away from this shit because it's fucked me up. I said to my brother, let's just pretend that I'm dead. Like, like oh, we'll make a oh, movie. And, I, and it, it wasn't, in, it sounds depressing, but it wasn't like that. Yeah, it was, it was like that, from that angle. Yeah, it's yeah. like, well, the future never. It's like, oh, there's, you, how far into the future? Everyone's going to die. How far into the past we could have gone to embryonic, the future, everyone dies. Mm. So let's really try and extend the future as far as possible. At some point I'm going to be dead. And if this is my lasting legacy, let's do it. And then if we get another throw the dice, and unfortunately we're just going to have to top it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there's going to be some massive art structures. It's very interactive. Um, there's going to be a lot of cool merch. It's, it's very um, futuristic pop art, mm -hmm. kind of. It feels like you're in something that's completely fictional, but the vast majority of it is based on truth. Mm -hmm. So it kind of feels like you couldn't make this shit up. One of the really fun things about it is there's so much, there's so much stuff that happened in my career which I completely either didn't know about even at the time or completely forgot about. And then all of the research was just coming through to me and that would like showing me clips from Beavis and Butthead and I was like, I don't, I don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember that, but it's, uh, it's right there. It's like, shit, yeah, okay. Huh? So there's all these little pop culture moments and all these people you know, kind of coming out of the woodwork, which I, I kind of forgot were fans or had spoken about Silverchair or me as an artist. I just forgot, or I didn't even know. I'm very excited to see this. Yeah, I'm, just, I'm, I'm really excited as well. 
So what's going on? We're here at the Past, Present, Future, Never exhibition, getting a sneak peek here in Melbourne. And it's still very much a work in progress. And they had to kind of block everything out so that no one can peek in and see the amazing structures that they're building. There is so much stuff in here. I'm talking Daniel's entire life. So I'm super excited for you to come take a sneak peek with me. Come on. Alright, so as you can see, there is so much in this one room and they're sorting through it. Uh, most of this will be on display, so you'll actually be able to see all of these outfits from Daniel. They're going to be put on mannequins. You're going to get to see, you know, his music notebooks, his, his book bag from school. There are so many magazines of Silverchair and Daniel being on the covers. So there's a lot to go through, fan mail and everything else. So you're gonna have a lot to look at. hard to put into words the scale of Daniel's fame, especially here in Australia. And today I've seen, I mean, just from so many of Daniel's guitars, all of his clothing from throughout the years, all of the merchandise, even his little teddy bear from when he was younger. For some reason, the thing that made me feel the most emotional was the silver chair road cases because they have all of the history. They've been there. They know where the bodies are buried. <laughs> so when Dan's label BMG kind of told me about this immersive art experience, I could have never imagined the scale and the ambition that it took to put something like this together. So it's truly remarkable. My name is Casey Golden, this is my brother Bo. Um, together we make up This Week in the Universe and we're here at the Daniel Johns Past, Present and Future Never exhibit. And um, it's amazing, it's seriously like super overwhelming and, and incredibly immersive. Like, like, I don't know, it's like been such a long time coming that it's just crazy to kind of feel like you're in the middle of, of the record, if that makes sense, you know? It was bigger than I thought, really. I and mean, you go in these little rooms and you keep going in extra little rooms and you see all this stuff and things that Dan spoke to us about when he was putting this together with um, uh, Radio Velvet and it was just, it's definitely, it was like quite overwhelming. Working on the record with Dan in his house, he doesn't really have anything on his on his walls. He's got like a, I think he's got like a Black Sabbath thing on or something on his wall, but you come here and you see like the platinum gold record, gold record, platinum record, gold record, platinum record, you're like, oh damn. You forget like globally how big Silver Chair was and, and the impact they had on, on everything um, in the Australian industry going forward and it's just, it's wild. What's good? It's Mason Dane, here at the Future Never Museum exhibit. We're here in uh, the halls and it's uh, it's super dope to be here, being a Nui boy, seeing like one of the only real like legends who come out of Newcastle, like seeing like the whole timeline and seeing, you know, places where I spent time and seeing where he came up, humble beginnings, I guess uh, it's super cool seeing his Newcastle High report card, seeing he was, you know, flunking out in science like I was. Uh, it's super dope, so uh, I'm just gassed to be here and, and check it out. Where I should grow. 
And we're here at the Daniel Johns Future Never exhibition. Um, personally, I like the Daniel Johns old PRS um, with the Fugazi sticker hanging on the wall. Um, probably climb up and grab that one later on the way out. Yeah, it's just awesome to see all the memorabilia from, from the years and personal items you never get to see. You know, really a once in a lifetime to see some of this stuff. Definitely a few shots of Dan on the wall that I remember seeing on my sister's bedroom uh, wall as a kid. And she got me into silver chair. And then going forward, I was a huge fan. He still, yeah, definitely inspires a lot of our writing and music to this day. Honestly, an incredible musician. Um, and yeah, the album itself is incredible, I think. It's doing incredibly well in the charts at the moment, still, which is a testament to yeah how how amazing Daniel Johns really is. Um, my favourite part of the exhibition is definitely the projection room. Um, just seeing that personalised kind of experience that Daniel projects through that is amazing. Just to see. When I was younger, my mum always made me listen to Silverchair, and that really like made my music taste what it is now, um, so I'm definitely going to get her to come and visit and come to the exhibition. Hey, I'm Chris. Uh, this is my wife Mel and our son Theodore. Um, for me personally, it's um, a really big moment because I was a massive, massive Daniel Johnson Silverchair fan when I was growing up. He's the reason that I kind of got into music, got into singing, got into bands, got into all that sort of stuff. And um, yeah, for me, Dan's pretty iconic. Um, anything to do with the way he used to talk, dress, act on stage, write music, I would try and copy and emulate. Today is actually my 30th birthday and this was the only place I really wanted to be. I was trying to look at all of the notes to find mine, but they all look like they're from 95 and I was like three years old then, so <laughs> I don't think mine's there. <laughs> What I loved about the exhibition was that he's been so willing to share so much of himself and the things that are around, um, with that ability be to almost instantly transported back in time. Yeah, it's been a really, really nice treat for us fans to be able to come and get a deeper look inside Daniel's mind. There's a, a black Gibson Les Paul, which they played at um, the last show we saw them at, which was Groove in the Moon. Yeah. Um, unbeknownst to us, that would be the last time that I think they even toured, I'm not sure, but so seeing that guitar game was pretty cool. Even just stepping in here, I was just like, oh my god, I can't believe this is like every dream, every moment of, of my silver chair experience wrapped up into like one moment. Um, and it's just so overwhelming, especially I'm loving seeing like all of like the, the arias and being able to, like something you're so invested in. Like I remember watching every single, and just being so excited to see all that history. This is, this is crazy. I'm just, I had a great time here. Um, I know that he isn't really keen on performing and, and doing that sort of concert scene again, but I think this sort of thing, I've, I've been to his concerts, Silverchair concerts and seen them live. And I've got to say like this experience is something that I've definitely taken more away from. Not to say that the concerts and everything went great, like they were fantastic, but um, just to be this immersed, it's really memorable and I think it's something that we'll never forget. Favourite part of the exhibition is very hard, probably everything. You know, from the minute you walk in, it just grabs you. Um, I love the laundromat, all the guitars, seeing all the guitars is incredible. I'm a 79 baby and I grew up with silver chair. And if I'm completely honest, it's really the only band that I've ever really liked, loved in fact. So yeah, it's just um, it's great to see, I guess, all the memorabilia and kind of remember all the memories that I had um, through you know listening to all the different songs and what the songs meant to me at the time. So it's a really lovely walk down memory lane, and yeah, I think it's I think it's just awesome that Daniel was able to do it um, for himself and um, you know hopefully. Silver chair fans around the world, we can all kind of, you know, remember the past and why that was so great. So yeah, it's just awesome.